the scholarly community. And so you have fringe scholars like Richard Carrier and agnostic scholars like, um, what's his name, um, Dr. Price, who are so fringe and, and, and incapable of actually engaging in the more richer, wider scholarly community. Uh, Dr. Price has been associated with the Jesus Seminar. That is a very limited part of the scholarly world in historical Jesus studies. So if you're going to debate on the resurrection of Christ, if you're going to show yourself to be competent, you need to be show that you've engaged with a wider scholarly community. For example, in this paper, I've mentioned Dominic Crossan, who I've consistently studied his material. I have mentioned Dale Allison, whose material I have studied. I have mentioned a whole variety of scholars that are completely different from my view, and I've honestly read them. And so your me methodology must be comprehensive and deep. And so my model is Adel Schlatter there. Secondly, you must have a methodology in understanding ancient text. It's no good quoting ancient text unless you put down and show us what you're using as a methodology. I use the historical grammatical method. I use a method where I try to look at ancient text whether the Bible or anything else, in its historical grammatical context. That is very clear because often skeptics will quote text and we're not aware of the hermeneutical method they are using and how they use that method in the interpretation of Gideon Hudwink by quotations from Bart Ehrman and by Richard Carrier, these kind of scholars who will quote a text but they are not giving us the methodology that they're using or, 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 and how they got to that quotation. If you want to know my methodology, go and read the books by Dr. Bob Utley, who is an expert. Uh, w, w, dot free bible commentary dot org pdf seminar textbook by dr bob utley so we 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 have a methodology of depth looking at primary source material and engaging with contemporary scholarship we have a a hermeneutic of historical grammatical method we have a historical we use a methodology that most scholars will use I help in my lecture to use the methods that historians use in assessing a hypothesis for historical data. This means my method tries to keep within the mainstream of historical scholarship. Also, it is very important to note, as we use the historian's tools, it means we are using historical data as evidence, not presuming or defending an inspired Bible. This is important because one or two skeptics have tried to strawman me here. They've tried to suggest that my belief in the Bible is the word of God is influencing my, in my understanding of the historical data. But I have been upfront and honest that I have presuppositions. But also the skeptic has to be honest that they have presuppositions. Discussion, even though my presupposition may be the inspired Bible, my argument does not rest on an inspired Bible, but upon historical method that secular historians use. So therefore, this argument against me would be a straw man. Number one, the historical method that historians would generally use is number one, explanatory scope. This means we look at the quantity of the facts that our hypothesis accounts. The hypothesis that has the most relevant facts has the best explanatory scope. Second, explanatory power. This looks at quality of the given facts. If you can explain your position with a less ambiguity, 
then it has better explanatory power. If one has a strong presence, you may get some due to the nature of patchiness of history. The hypothesis conforms to the background knowledge better than any other position. We look at opposing views and see also if they conform, confirmed by anything in history or today by sciences. Fourth, hat less ad hoc. We use less non-evidence assumptions. We are in a better position than using such arguments that lack any evidence. And five, illumination. A hypothesis can provide good solutions to historical problems, and if this is the position, it strengthens one case. One's case. Page 109 to 111, The Resurrection of Jesus, Mike Lacona, A New Historical Approach, IVP 2010. Uh, in the paper, uh, a roundtable discussion with Mike Lycona on the resurrection of Jesus. He says, when conducting authentic historical investigation, one cannot presuppose that the source with which we are working are ignorant or divinely inspired. Otherwise, we would simply conclude everything reported in those sources is true and wrap up the investigation. A theologian can do that when studying Jesus. A historian does not have that luxury. Theology and history are different disciplines with different objectives and approaches. Now I believe that everything in the Bible is true, but that's a statement of faith and has to be argued by reason of a different sort. My object in the book was to see what I could prove concerning Jesus' resurrection with reasonable and adequate historical certainty apart from any faith commitment. My approach is a little bit nuanced than Lycona. I recognize actually in ancient historiography and in present historiography there is always theological reflection. Historian has ever written in history without putting their interpretation. Interpretation is theological reflection. It is a theological, it is not historical. So you cannot have history without information and facts and interpretation. It is not possible. So I would disagree a little bit with my friend Mike Lacona. Not, not my friend personally, but a, a man who I greatly respect. What I would say is that we all, whether skeptic or not, all are influenced by our biases, but that we can look at historical f facts and come to some objective understanding, but we have to recognize that our presuppositions will be there and influence our interpretation. You can never completely get away from presuppositions. You can never completely get to the facts without being influenced by presuppositions. But at the same time, we can look at reality of the facts. They are there, facts are facts, but there is a tension, there is an interplay between facts and presuppositions. So my position is much more nuanced and much more subtle than Mike Lacona's. But we have a criteria that the secular historians use and we use that in our historical di discussion. The next, we build on the facts that we already know. Dr. E.P. Sanders has noted has noted a number of facts facts that the scholarly world generally agree with. Now what the atheists do not tell you, what the secular scholars do not tell you who are anti-Christianity, they do not tell you that the vast majority of these scholars who write on the resurrection like Dr. Carrier, Earl Doherty, David Fitzgerald, Robert, Dr. Robert Price, all these skeptics reject the main body of facts that the academic world already acknowledges. E.P. Sanders said, gives these facts. Number one, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Number two, Jesus was a Galilean who preached and did healings. Number three, 
Jesus had 12 disciples according to him. Number four, Jesus did his work for Israel. Number five, Jesus was controversial at the temple. Six, Jesus was crucified outside Jerusalem by Roman authorities after his death. Jesus followed as a movement. And finally, a group of Jews persecuted at least part of the new movement. Galatians chapter 1, 13, 22, Philippians 3, 6. The persecution continued up to the end of Paul's career, 2 Corinthians 11, 24, Galatians 5, 11, 6, 12, Matthew 23, 34. E.P. Sanders, 1985, Jesus and Juda Judaism, uh, Philadelphia Fortress Press. And just a little aside, notice how I'm using a wide variety of scholars. Notice how I'm interacting with a wider scholarly community. Virtually no atheist on the internet or even the atheist scholars will do what I've done in quoting such a wide variety of scholars and engage with them. So we've looked at presuppositions, we've looked at methodology. And now let's just look at some of the data, the evidence for the resurrection. Now, all what I've done and given to you today, I offered to debate Aaron Ra and he ran away from a debate with me because he knew he couldn't be beat me in debate on this. I had a, bit, a debate with DPR Jones, I beat him in debate. I only touched on the resurrection a little bit. I had a, a discussion with um, Ozzy on the historical aspects of Jesus. I had a discussion with Thunderfoot. But none of these atheists, none of these atheists in any way, in any way tackled my scholarship my arguments and what I had to say on the resurrection of Christ. No proper debates were provided for so that we could discuss this topic in a very scholarly academic way. The atheist community completely and utterly run from these challenges for debates. Only recently John McDropout challenged uh, took on the challenge for a debate and I would actually love to debate him and I've said I would debate him and given him uh, a said to him that I would debate him but when you have idiots ride into the city center and try to film you atheist when you have that kind of pressure put on you with silly accusations and all that kind of stuff going on and people like John Mc drop out um, commentating on archive channels that are in the kind of uh, behavior then I'm not going to be willing to debate someone unless they make it clear that they disassociate themselves 